thank you so much for inviting me here and uh, it's wonderful to meet you all, you global citizens of the world, um, and start my Sunday morning off this way. It, it's uh, it's a, quite a challenge. Miriam said to me, well, you know, the last few thousand years have been a mess, so what are the next few thousand years going to be like? The future, you're on. So that's kind of quite a big, a big uh, sort of task to do this morning. Um, but it's given me a really great opportunity to think through all the threads that I have been following, not only my whole life, but particularly since this pandemic started, because it's been a wonderful opportunity. I think for many of us, of course, a horrible situation for many. I'm not um, making that sound as if it's not important. A lot of people suffering in horrible ways. But at the same time, for many of us, it's given that opportunity for us to pause, to have this kind of conversation, to be online and listen to people, to speakers, to visionaries, to thought leaders that we probably wouldn't have done in the normal times. We wouldn't have had the time. We wouldn't have been in the same space. And now through the wonders of Zoom, here we are with access to all sorts of extraordinary people. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about myself. I actually left school, unlike I think a lot of you who I think come from a more academic background, I left school at 16 and went on my journey of life and uh, went to my university of life and started my own business when I was 21, which was a PR business. Uh, it was a new industry. Uh, I'd always been very attracted to social trends and popular culture. So I kind of fell into this uh, world of fashion and music and beauty. I mean, it was the seventies, early seventies. I was part of Live Aid, all the things that were going on, which were part of my own cultural experience. Um, were happening, particularly in the UK, particularly in London. So I was very much part of that. So for 20 years, I created London Fashion Week. I worked for all the main retailers. I did a lot of work with design and designers. I'm very much part of the 80s, I guess, with, with stores in central London of my own. So, um, it was just my attraction at the time. But it wore out as I saw that there was indeed so many other things going on in the, in the world other than just the latest frock length. So I had, with all this period of time, without question, um, become more aware of my own ability to uh, use my own intuition as well as my, um, my scattered mind pulling in all these bits of information from everywhere and turning it into how I saw the future. Quite often I'd be a little bit too early. Uh, it's interesting when I look at my own journey over the last 72 years, how I um, was always kind of ahead of the game. I mean, the press would write about me and talk about me as the zeitgeist. I'd be plugged into things before they happen. Now, that is, it's like everything's caught up and all the things I've been talking about for so many years have caught up with me. So I sold my PR business in the late 80s and I went on a journey of self-discovery as well as a journey of what's happening for the world. And my world previously had not been focused on women and um, as actually Simon wrote in the chat room this morning, the rape of women over the last thousands of years, my, um, my concentration and focus had really been on fashion, which was a world mostly consisting of women and gay men. So it hadn't been really noticeable that uh, we had a society of women being treated so badly. And then I went bing and I found out that actually my rather uh, comfortable life which I've created myself with my passion and enthusiasm for all things um, of the time, was actually a very superficial way of looking at the world. And I got, started getting involved in causes. I started working with Amnesty, Greenpeace, did all kinds of awareness, using my skills as a PR, using my skills to understand how to affect and influence and inform and communicate um, in, about situations that really people didn't know about but using the mainstream media and the mainstream, um, the mainstream channels of communication, which when I was just, I stopped and hesitated then, because when I look back to what I was using then, of course we didn't have social media, we were not on the internet. We did not have this way of going in a Zoom room in our little boxes and talking to people all over the world. It was different. So I've been learning along the way what that difference is and how we still can communicate and uh, connect with each other. Um, at the same time, I've realized that a lot of it is about local, and it really is that think local, act global world that we live in now. So um, I started writing books, primarily, they were for women actually, um, and they, uh, the first book that I wrote that really had some kind of uh, big influence was, was called The Seed Handbook. It came out looking very 
flowery, which is indeed what it was, um, using the metaphors of a garden for women to start sustainable businesses. And SEED is an acronym for Sustainable Enterprise and Empowerment Dynamics. And that was 20 years ago, the feminine way to create business. Um, that came out and it's still coming out all over the world, even in Pashto in Afghanistan more recently and Kazakh and Russian. And it was the first book that was written for women about starting their own small, that doesn't have to be small, but their own businesses based on personal values, that they had another alternative, another choice. If they weren't happy, which a lot of them weren't in the corporate world or the public sector, they had a new way of, of being and going. And um, again, intuitively that came up. I, I, um, I put on an event in London uh, after I saw my business called What Women Want. And I took over the South Bank and um, I had uh, a whole series of workshops and seminars over three days on every aspect of the South Bank in London. For those of you who don't know it, the Festival Hall, it's a, it's a big complex, a cultural arts complex. So we had extraordinary conversations going on. Uh, I was supported by the late, great Anita Roddick, for those of you who know, from the Body Shop, and um, a number of other wonderful people, women. We had all sorts, the sort of workshops we had going on, if you think it was in 95, it's not that long ago, we were teaching women how to use the internet. I mean, it seems like we've always known how to use the internet, but in 95, we had a queue miles long of people just having the opportunity to go on a computer and be shown how to use it and how to get online. We were doing things on natural health. We were doing things on sexuality, women to have a voice in uh, their own sexuality. We uh, were talking about art, culture, the power of women as a consumer. Um, and we had a big concert on the Saturday night with Sinead O'Connor and Chrissy Hind and the Pretenders and Jermaine Greer came and spoke. And I had it started by a group of nuns from Ireland um, who were the Brigidine sisters that I'd been introduced to by Sinead O'Connor. And they were, if you like, the descendants of the priestesses of Bridget. And they came with a holy flame from Ireland. And so the Evening Standards headline at the time was Sex, Nuns and Rock and Roll at Lynn's Women's Festival. And it was actually, a, it was a very special event. And I, and I look back with great pride. And then everybody was saying, well, what are you doing next year? And in my usual way, I was like, well, next year I'll be doing something else. That's uh, me as a, I, I, I have created a series of seven archetypes um, from the seed work, which by the way, became a whole series of content, which has been delivered everywhere from African rural villages to post-war zones, to women's prisons, to the corporate boardroom. Seed became an entity in itself, representing women and empowerment within um, their communities. And as I said, that could be anything from working together in rural villages in Africa, where I went out and was working with a whole series of um, villages about how the women themselves, so at that point, and still not hasn't changed, were being abused uh, in a most horrible way, were still going walking miles to get the water. This is South Africa and it's still, in fact, that particular rural area is suffering even worse at the moment with the pandemic, so I've just been told. So there, there, there was lots of ways that my work went from this rather a fashionable world and um, consumer awareness to understanding there was a lot of suffering going in the world. I also got very uh, close with Eve Ensler, who wrote Vagina Monologues, who's done a huge amount to um, bring awareness for using cyber for the rape of women over thousands of years. And um, I was very involved in bringing awareness of what was going on in the uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, the DRC. At that point, we didn't know in the UK that um, the uh, that rape was being used as a weapon of war, which indeed it is all over the world. Um, and so I've had a lot to do with bringing awareness into um, the political world as well as the world, the everyday world of what's really going on for women. So I've been, I guess, involved in, in grassroots, um, grassroots change and grassroots uh, influence for many years. And that has progressed on until um, we've got to the point we are now. So I don't want to just talk about me. I just want to give you a bit of background. So my background came from understanding how the world worked commercially then moving through to working with NGOs and causes and charities um, about the information that we really should be hearing about understanding how technology has taken on this journey and then how I wake up one day and find my goodness the world has changed and being a 60s child I am more than aware as I'm sure a lot of you are that we have been given information that could have taken us to a very different place today 
than it has done. And the world has really, for well, thousands of years, and I know Miriam was very keen on this, looking back at the thousands of years of history, which I, in my eyes, it, it kind of goes back to Cecil B. DeMille movies, which I watched in the 50s as a child, where you'd see um, Charlton Heston coming down from the mountain with the tablets and throwing them on the ground. And Miriam, actually, his sister, Miriam, um, who was a high priestess down there doing um, what was seen as worshipping the golden the golden calf but actually was goddess worship so we've gone from a very matriarchal to a patriarchal thousand few thousand years and i really think it started when we stopped being as a human race nomadic and we started um staying in places which all became about ownership putting up fences domesticating animals and then it was about who owns what so we can go back thousands of years then we see where money came in even back to what they talk about um the high the priest in the temple and jesus throwing out uh, the money lenders there. Uh, I'm a Jew, so this is coming from, <laughs> sorry, not coming from a, um, uh, some an ethnic place. It's coming back from our history. Where did we start all this currency and money? And when did money become the god? And when were decisions made about human beings' lives and the future of this planet based just on greed and power and money? And it's it's just it horrifies me and brings me to tears actually on a daily basis that we live in a world which we have got to and so many people have suffered and are still suffering in so many countries um countries represented here in this group in fact who who uh, should it should not have happened and i pray that the situation we're in now takes us to the understanding we are a global nation and we can be together, work together and create change. So that's where I've got, and I want to now talk about the future, if I may, but bringing in the wisdom of the past, because in my own journey of understanding how we can do things, I can see that the amount of wisdom that has been shared that the general human public have not been listening to has been there for us for years and years and years and I I will bring back a few names that I want to talk about but I look at the work of Nikolai Tesla and his work with energy and how we would have all had pure free energy for the hunt that he's he was doing this over a hundred years ago I look at the work of um of uh, Rudolf Steiner and and his work with agriculture and his work with education of course there's many many that we've had the wisdom from and there's a wonderful quote which i'm just looking for now from buckminster fuller who's another one of my sort of stars if you like a philosopher an architect and a wise man and he said and this is really the theme of my talk um and i love this quote you never change things by fighting the existing reality to change something build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. That's a very well-known quote for those of you who um, follow Buckminster Fuller's work. Um, um, I can't follow my speech and chat it, put it on the chat room, but I can do it later. You never change things by, it's, it's on Google, by fighting the existing reality to change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. And that is the opportunity that we have now. So before I go into the details, of where I think we're coming from. And I also actually, before I even go to that, want to just add that it's not just our modern, and when I say modern, the last few hundred years, scientists, philosophers, and visionaries that have been telling us there's a different way of doing things that have been ignored because it didn't suit the, um, it didn't suit the purposes of the big companies, the pharmaceutical companies, the banks, the energy companies who only saw it as a profit sees the world there as some kind of toy to play with to make profits from and doesn't relate at all to the fact that actually these these decisions they're making let's go to war in iraq and let's destroy iraq because saddam hussein's not behaving himself right now and we want access to the oil i mean i you know you can go through every single situation what king leopold did to uh, the congo that got it to the state it's in because there was he there was a all sorts of ownership with the British Empire and other countries and, and Belgium didn't have anywhere. I've, I've read quite a lot about it, so I'm not just talking out of the sky. And he, he was recommended that he could go and take Belgium because it had lots of fantastic resources um, and there was no one taking ownership. So all kinds of sub deals that went on, which are all available in the history books to read. And suddenly Belgium owns Congo, really? And it was the Congo DRC was made up of a number of country, countries and areas. And of course, phenomenally rich. And so the reasons why the women have been raped and abused in such a horrific way and still are, is because a decision that was made 
by greedy people, several hundred, you know, I don't know, when was Leopold? A hundred or so years ago, has raped the country, has raped Mother Earth, taken their resources, used them in things that we need, like our mobile phones. I'm embarrassed to say, coal time, which comes into our phones, our computers. I mean, you know, it's we're all part of this this world of, of what's gone on. Anyway, um, having um, and I also sorry, just I, so many things I want to say, um, but I also want to say that the indigenous wisdom is something we've also ignored for so many years. We have, as a culture, as humanity, tried to destroy the indigenous people and destroy the wisdom. So there has been so much knowledge um, and um, so much understanding and warnings from the indigenous world. And what we've done is we've tried to like, look at Australia, you look at the United States or all the countries where we've tried to breed out any of the wisdom and um, the, the traditions and the cultures of the indigenous people. So the ones that have survived have been locked away, whether it mostly in, in uh, Latin America, mostly in the, the uh, general, jungle areas, mountain areas, and have come out and said, we are warning you, there isn't long left. And we've said, oh yes, thank you. Come and appear at our festivals. That's very nice to hear that. We love your, we love your feathered headdresses and we'll do your rituals and take your plant medicine. But are we actually listening to you? Are we actually listening that we really have to make change now? No, we're not. And we have to do this. And so I believe that we can follow Buckminster Fuller's guidance and we can make change by coming together as a grassroots network and network of networks which is why Miriam what you're doing is so so important why all of you are so so important because every one of us has got the opportunity to talk to another 10 people and those 10 people can go out and talk to another 10 each and before you know we've got an army out there and when I say army I don't like using metaphors of war because it's actually not what I believe I don't believe it. we are we are warriors of peace and love and we have to shift at a grassroots le a level um, through local enterprise, through communities coming together, through collaboration, and through, um, Paul Hawkins wrote a book, I think a few years ago, about how we can bring networks of networks together. There are literally hundreds of thousands of small and large community networks, um, all kinds of groups, some NGOs, some social enterprise, there's loads of us out there. And we actually, come, if we come together, that, I'm not saying we're the majority, but we're a good balance to the nonsense that's going on and the rubbish, stupid leadership that is so evident any of us can be bothered to pick up our newspapers or look at the television news and look at these decisions. I mean, today I've noticed that we're not, suddenly we're not allowed to go to Spain anymore. Yesterday we were allowed to go to Spain. I mean, where are these decisions? What is the rationality? What is the sense? We can wear, in the UK, now, since Friday, we have to wear masks to go into shops, but we don't have to wear masks if we work in the shops. We don't have to wear masks if we go into cafes. We don't have to wear masks in gyms. I mean, I'm not going to go on. It's too much of a nonsense. But, um, you know, the reality of, of what's going on surely must give us the understanding that if this sort of nonsense can go on, we can make change. So here I am. I'm getting all my very excited first thing on a Sunday morning. So um, Miriam said, say it as it is. So here I go. So this is a book I wrote called Grow, The Modern Woman's Handbook. And I wrote this 15 years ago. And to be perfectly honest, I'd forgotten I'd written this. And in my general research of other people's wisdom and knowledge, I found that I had set out 15 years ago what I saw as the utopian future and why not utopia? Why can't we create a utopian future? Everything we all believe. And if I didn't think every one of you believed it, uh, you wouldn't be here this morning because we're all on this journey of creating a better world. We are all on this journey of creating a world where our grandchildren and the seven generations to come, as the indigenous grandmothers say, will have a world which is based on love, safety. And there is sufficiency for all. Right now there's sufficiency for all. If it wasn't owned by a few very, very greedy and immoral people, there is sufficient food, there's sufficient shelter, there's, there's education. Anyway, sorry. So this is from me, Shaping the Future. And it is coming from a feminine perspective, not feminist, feminine. But we are all, you know, male, female. It's not a gender issue here much. <laughs> not you guys. Uh, as women, we are traditionally the caretakers of our culture. Our responsibility is to understand and somehow make sure that the changes that are happening in our world preserve the basic humanity in us all. By connecting with the principles of the sacred feminine, such as those found in ancient matriarchal civilizations, a more nurturing society can evolve. 
one that abhors violence, advocates such values as justice, compassion and love, and raises its children to reach their full potential as human beings. When people talk with such idealism, they are often accused of being naive. How can we change a world that's solidly entrenched in the way of competition, domination and violence? My answer is that without creating the vision, nothing can be achieved. And without having the attention for that change in our hearts, we will find ourselves living in a world that perpetuates everything that goes against our sensibilities. Brahma Kumari leader, Sister Gianti, addressed this point at a conference, a conference on conflict resolution in Sweden in 2001. I'm a big fan of the Brahma Kumaris and Sister Gianti. I've worked with them a lot. She said it would only take a relatively small group of committed individuals to initiate the transformation of human consciousness to a more positive, caring society. The beliefs of the minority reaching the point of critical mass will shift the majority and create a culture of peace. If we're talking about getting rid of the old, outdated, patriarchal ways of running the world, it's essential to present a pragmatic vision of what we want to replace it with. We need an overall blueprint of what a new world based on principles of the sacred feminine would look like and how it would work. The primary foundation for such a world is cooperation. First and foremost, it's cooperation between male and female. As women, we know that the best and most efficient way to get things done is to work together. And that means living and working with men in harmonious coexistence, valuing the perspectives and strengths of both sexes and creating a higher quality of life for all. It must also be a world of cooperation between business and community, human beings and the planet, national governments and, and non-governmental organizations, young and old, spirituality and science, and our inner and outer selves. And I wrote this 15 years ago, but if it meant something then, today it really does mean something. The opportunity to cre create this world does exist now. It is possible to create a society where we can bring people together and heal our families, our communities, and our world. To do so would take a new breed of leaders, ones who aren't tied to the old ways of doing things. Rather than money or power, these leaders must have spiritual values to guide them. And since spiritual values are at our core, it is vitally important for women to step up and take the lead in, the transformation of society, in this transformation of society. A cooperative society is an organic, evolutionary step away from the world we presently live in. When the power of national governments diminish, that power will naturally transfer into specific small and large networks which transcend national boundaries and link with one another. Consequently, a new economic order could be created that truly rewards efforts, including the caring of others. Distribution of land and natural resources would be fairly shared amongst the people who live on it, and the need to conquer and repress others in the name of power would not be a consideration. Cooperative ways of working together, whether in agriculture or small enterprise networks, which encourage individual creativity instead of exploiting workers, would develop gradually as this new feminine paradigm took hold, takes hold. And in a cooperative society, training in technology skills would be open for all, and education in understanding the difference between cultures and beliefs of others would become an intrinsic element of society. Traditional and holistic medicine would integrate, creating a new science which treats and creates and cures disease based in part on sensible nutrition, exercise, and meditation. Our senior citizens would be revered and respected, keeping our history, both personal and societal, alive. Men and women would create new kinds of relationships, sexual and platonic, based on mutual respect and love, rather than selfish needs and society's expectations. We would have freedom of choice in how we wish to live in every aspect of our lives. Yes, it is a somewhat utopian vision, but we must believe that it is also possible to achieve it. Our personal responsibility in making all this come about is to first bring ourselves into the same sort of harmonious balance we wish to see in the world. By finding a state of peace within us where we stay calm and balanced, we can project a sense of love and creativity to those we engage with. Through our feminine principles, we can achieve a natural state of being that is connected with others. It is then up to us to live within our own cooperative world. And only when we can achieve this personally can we truly begin to create a new 
feminine future. So that was what I wrote 15 years ago and more relevant than ever. And now is the time we can do it. Um, I'm looking quickly at the chat room and Sean has written something and I will go back to that. So I mentioned a number of areas and I'm just looking at the time as well. I'm looking at my You're phone. You're fine actually. Still yeah, got, yeah, it's still got a quarter of an hour I think. Um, yeah, no, no, I'm fine. I'm watching. Yeah. Uh, I've got a huge clock just beyond the computer. <laughs> it's out me. Very well organised. I've been teaching a retreat here all weekend so I've got all my things everywhere. So um, I talked to you about self. I talked to you about my journey. But I think it is about ourselves. It is about us finding that peace within us. Um, and it's, it's kind of an interesting challenge right now because I don't know about you, but I am just flooded with stories about um, conspiracies. And it's this, and it's that fault, and we're all blaming, and it's the Chinese, and it's the Americans, and it's the Russians. And we are just bombarded, whether we watch the news, whether it's in the papers, or on our own inbox and our social media, we are bombarded. So detaching from that, you know, it may be the Russians, it may be the Chinese, it may be the Americans, I don't know, maybe aliens for all I know, it's all coming in from every direction. It doesn't matter. Whatever it is, if we stay in that space, of dark shadow, that is where we will remain. And right now we have the choice to go into the light, if you don't mind me using these spiritual analogies, or stay in the dark. And it's not just spiritual, it's, it's real. So let's, so instead of, I have a number of friends, men I have to say, who are very conscious in some ways, who are just sending me non-stop bombarding me with more videos about whose fault it is and who's behind it, and I don't care. I really don't care, the fact is, we have the opportunity now to make a change and we have to stay detached in that space of love in our hearts and for whatever our, or whatever our spiritual uh, following is, you know, stay connected, some peace and silence and using this time just to stay connected with our hearts, but at the same time staying very aware of what's going on in the world, not the rumours and the theories, but actually where we can create change, where positive change can be made, where we can communicate with each other as we are in this beautiful group of people here. It's incredible the amount of countries represented here. Incredible, I really congratulate you, Miriam. It's an amazing, it's an amazing gift to all come together. And I'm looking forward to stop talking in a minute and listen to all of you as well. And it's so, so we start with self, let's find that peace inside. Let's not go wandering off or down all those rabbit holes that are taking us to all those different theories about what's really going on. And let's create, like Buckminster Fuller says very clearly, something that is so new and so attractive that that's where people will just want to go. And I do think that will be very much led by women and I do think it will be from the grassroots and it will be from small local initiatives, small local groups. And the men are more than welcome to join us, but we also need to feel in our leadership roles that we can do something together and we can be strong together. So community, tribe, one global nation, these are my notes. What works for the children? For me, any decision that's made that's coming out of any shift in society now, the question has always got to be, does this work for the children? Does this work for the children? They are the ones that are going to inherit this planet, not us. And that's what we have to always have front of mind as far as I'm concerned. Um, which brings me to education. Um, I would love to see, I have seven grandchildren myself, I would love to see this opportunity for a change in education much more on the Steiner model, forest schools. There was some research, I was listening to somebody from Canada the other day that showed 60% of education can be done outdoors. So I'm not suggesting we send poor little things out in the cold, but to take children into nature, to get them to understand about what nature is really about, growing their own, planting their seeds, growing their own vegetables. There's a wonderful school you may know in Bali called the Green School that does exactly that, that's taken the best of Steiner, brought it into the modern age, and the children that are there are given responsibility for their education. I mean, there's so much we can do and it has to start with education as far as I'm concerned. Um, agriculture, it is amazing you have had, and I've missed, I'm afraid, the wonderful, wonderful Vandana Shiva on this uh, conference all weekend, who I am a huge fan of. She is a visionary, she is a leader in every way. And what she talks about with seeds um, and water, and also another great woman, Helena Norberg, who's not on here, but I'm sure her name's come up, who's been working with the whole area of localization. How can we start working with localization, growing our vegetables? It's happening. I mean, you know, I live in Somerset in a little English town, but we are growing our own vegetables here. And that's the other thing that I think a lot of people have taken this opportunity. I mean, this might sound mad to those countries 
people have got a more rural based economy. And, but over here, for us to stop going to the supermarket and buying imported vegetables, which are using you know, transport that they don't need, where we can actually eat locally, grow locally and be a local community, we, we really have to start with that. And that takes me on to the circular economy. Um, I don't know how many of you are aware about the donut economy. If you don't, look it up. It's an amazing uh, concept. It's just common sense, really. It's using all kinds of diagrams. It's uh, a book that's been out for a number of years. And uh, it's written by Kate Rawthorne. And it's been just uh, a lot of stories about it this week because it's just been announced that Amsterdam is becoming the first donut economy city. You may know this. And... Um, I think Portland and Costa Rica, there's also one. And, the, and what the donut community is about, it's very, very simple. I mean, it's all circular because we are talking about a new circular economy in a general sense. And it's about being aware as a city, which is incredible, the whole of Amsterdam's doing it, as a town, as a village, as a community, what we can do, everything that we do can, as has an effect on something else ecologically. So if we're doing certain kinds of industry, how, what is the bad effect? How can we change that? to be positive for nature. So there are, I, I won't go through the whole details of it because it's, it's quite a big thing, but basically they look at social, ecological, and local and global effects. What would it mean for this? What would it take for the people of this city to thrive in a healthy way? What would it take for this city to, to, to thrive within its natural habitat? So there was talk last night, I was listening to a talk on, um, on uh, a universal rising, the Ubiquiti University talk they do every day with incredible speakers. And it's about a project in Amsterdam using trees that have been foraged from the city that have come down anyway, turning those into products that range from textiles, perfume, um, uh, beautiful objects, uh, cups, everything. How you can take things that we have thrown away and actually turn those into something which is good for the economy and good for the habitat, more important. What would it mean for this city to respect the health of the whole planet? So how can we as a community making decisions look for the whole planet? And what would it mean for the city to respect the well-being of people worldwide? So those are the four pillars, if you like, of um, Donut Economy, and it's all available for you to have a look at, and I really would recommend it. And circular economy means more things. Charles Eisenstein, who has been very, pre uh, very present in many talks uh, as a philosopher and uh, thought leader, over these last few months from America, um, talks about the gift economy, where if you give things away without expectations back, you will get it back. I mean, that is one of the futures of doing things. I see a real return to local currency, and I see a return to far more barter and exchange. And I think at the same time, we will be using technology, particularly in Africa, I'd be interested to see what the African delegates here think, but um, the telephone is clearly being used more and more over there as a way of banking, as a way of uh, doing your business. And if we can bring in transactions that are using blockchain technology, if we can simplify that, not to use cryptocurrency, but to use blockchain, and it is happening, there, are, there is somebody in Iceland I've been put in touch with, who's working with a number of charities, on how we can use blockchain technology because it's something we can do on our phones to do transactional exchange, which is not based on currency, which can be used with NGOs, local communities, currencies, um, and it's transparent, as you know, and it stays on the internet, it doesn't go away. It's completely the opposite of banking, which is just full of spoken mirrors. It is there and it's, there's going to be a big shift in that and we're going to be seeing that happen. I, I'm wanting to work and I've already started working with women refugees using the seed, um, um, toolkits, if you like, and philosophy of going uh, developing for the Mid East, and we're hoping for Africa too, where we can work with women in the local communities, creating products and actually um, working with them, even if they're food products for the local community, working out how that they can be have a template to make it easier. In many ways, we are actually taking their templates of what have been traditions for hundreds of years, actually, of the women in the communities supporting the younger women coming up. They grow, they grow their seeds, they take their vegetables to market, they sell them, and with their profit, they buy more seeds, which they give to the younger women who are then coming up. But how can we create him? I mean, I've been working uh, with my friend Bibi Russell. I know there's someone here from Bangladesh who works with the weavers in Bangladesh, as well as in Asia and other countries teaching them skills, old skills, and then making sure those products are available and accessible and sold, and they get a fair amount of the money back. Um, volunteerism. 
volunteerism in community. We're going to see more of that. I mean, we've got, I can only look at a few of you right now, but the majority of us seem to be baby boomer generation. And, you know, we have a lot of wisdom. We are the wisdom keepers. We are the men and women who have had the experience, who have had the learning, who do care about the future. And um, we can give, we should be sharing that wisdom, not only amongst ourselves, but be supporting and mentoring young people. And it's very interesting that it seems the two generations that come together are predominantly the baby boomers. And I'm not the first to say this, but I, I've been aware of it somehow. And um, the sort of teenagers through to 35. Um, I'm sure there's some kind of name for them, the millenniums and the younger ones. Um, I mean, I have more, I have, my two assistants are aged 18 and 23 and they are with me absolutely on everything that I do and support me and talk to their friends about the same things and they do yoga and they don't abuse their bodies and they're, they're two young women and they, they go to festivals and we all love music and we dance around our office at least once or twice a week because uh, I do think culture, let me bring that in, and music and joy is something that we must not forget and the more we get told to put these bloody awful masks on everywhere we go we must at least which i'm not doing by the way um we, we lose that side of humanity and so it's important that we keep the joy in our lives with the culture so uh, i just wanted to add that in so on the circular economy we could just have you know a whole conference alone and i'm sure there's going to be many and you are the green economy so i don't need to add that obviously all economies should be based on what is good for the planet and will be um energy we're seeing <laughs> Sorry, chair collapse. The energy already out there. Um, we're looking already at uh, the end of fossil fuel. Um, that's happening anyway with electric cars. But as I'm sure many of you know, and I just get my notes out, I'm a huge fan of Nikolai Tesla. He created ways that we could have been having natural energy for the last 150 years. And uh, for those of you who aren't so aware, please look it up. And of course, he's done a huge amount of work with bioresonance machines that were used in hospitals um, all over. The America particularly, which are, they're still being used by those who are kind of more into the holistic medicine world that based on Tesla's work. He created the hydroelectric power plant in Niagara Falls, of course. He explored solar energy, the power of the sea. I mean, he was a genius. And he got, and he got funding originally from the American people with money. Um, JP Morgan was his financier. He put up a big tower just outside New York, Tesla's tower, with all his information in. And then when Morgan realized that actually uh, Tesla's work went out there, he wouldn't be earning much money because there's no way they could regulate the energy. And um, General Electric came in and went in partnership with Morgan. So suddenly out of the blue, Tesla's tower burned down. And, and this is on the internet, so you can check it out. I believe it. The FBI took over all Tesla's notes and the FBI agent that went sent in to get out what was ever left after the fire was called John Trump. I'll just say that, and he is, according to history, Donald Trump's uncle, just putting that out there. So I'm, I'm not one way or another, I'm just saying a bit of history there. So Tesla ended up dying in a one room in New York, I think he died, or Chicago, you know, poor, on his own, tragic. This man should have, he should have a statue put up. So I just wanted to bring that up. And so we're now looking at, we get cars trendily called Teslas because they're electric. But what happened to Mr. Tesla himself? I mean, that's another opportunity where we could have had a different kind of world and greed took over. Um, in terms of ancient wisdom, I've mentioned indigenous people, but I think more and more people are getting attracted to a spiritual way of life, um, more than religious and religion too. Whatever it is, um, we, it's important as part of our own growth, I think, whether it's, they call it in the business world, mindfulness, let's stay mindful. It's consciousness. There's a different vibration happening. If you open up to that vibration, you can feel it in your body. And it's a vibration that if we open up as a positive uh, change can really take us. We, I mean, the amount of women that I work with and they, I say, well, what did you do today? I went out to nature. Even if they live in a city, I went for a walk. I went to the park. I was in my garden. You know, it's become more and more essential. I talked about Steiner. I talked about education. Um, I also think there's so much. I also talked about the wisdom keepers. We can give back to our children, our grandchildren, and other people's grandchildren. On health, I mentioned Tesla. There is so much that we are not doing on health. If we can move away from the, um, I mean, of course, there's some things we need to do using more modern um, health techniques. If we break a leg, we want to fix it, I guess. But there is so much knowledge out there from the flowers, from the plants, from the herbs. 500 years ago in my town, the women that were, were uh, called witches because they were using the local herbs to heal people and they were killed. It happened in many countries. The herbalists, the knowledge, the wisdom, 
disappeared. It was another thing that Steiner was very on top of was how we use the herbs and how we can use agriculture to heal our bodies. So I am a huge exponent on, and believer in that everything we need um, is out there for us. And it's just about building up our immunity system and living a healthy life, and having a positive attitude and, and really eating from the land and, and using herbs to heal ourselves. So it's so important that we bring back into the mainstream all this. Housing, well, Buckminster Fuller created these geodesic domes many years ago. I just say I haven't got time now to go into depth, but there's a lot of housing we could be doing in a holistic way. Um, we could be off grid, we could be, I mean, he created the term Earthship, didn't he? And, you know, the whole Earthship concept is something we should all be looking at. Um, so I'm almost on time. So creating the dream, that's what we need to do. And I remember as a small, ch oh, I'd also want to mention one other thing you might know or not know, Michael Tellinger's work from South Africa, one small town, the Ubuntu work that he's been doing for a long time, which is all about volunteerism. If you take a town of 6,000 and you have the uh, population giving three hours volunteerism a month, you can change your whole economy, do your own, your own power. I mean, I think there's a few cracks in it, uh, but equally, I think there's a lot there. So I live in a town of 6,000 and I'm working with this town on how we can change this. And it's not easy because there's people here that like the old ways, but how can we create new ways? How can we create a new future for my little community? Uh, using the idea of Ubuntu, it's all for one and one for all, we are all one, um, and create change. So that's where I am. I'm working on a global basis. I'm working with developing ideas that are going to be going, first of all, to the women refugees, particularly in the Middle East, uh, because they are suffering the most, and uh, finding ways for them to have some kind of economic um, independence and, well, just, an, just some kind of income, actually, never mind independence. Um, and so that's, that's a lot of what I'm doing, local, global. I can't, <laughs> I, I, I appreciate what Miriam said, which was very generous of her when she introduced me. I certainly don't look at myself doing this on my own. I can only do this in collaboration with others. Um, anybody that would like to work with me in any way at all, please share. I mean, I'm just here sitting in my office, in my studio office in Somerset, the sun coming through my window thinking, you know, we can only make this change if we do it together. I mean, that is the fact. So, um, and, we and we come from the grassroots. So we have to dream the dream. When I was at school, I didn't do very well at school because I was always sitting, looking out of the window, dreaming. And I used to get told constantly by the teachers, stop daydreaming, get back into the classroom. We have to encourage the dreamers in our society, whether they're children at school, whether they're our people of all our ages, we need the dreamers, we need to dream in the dream, and then we need to say, okay, between us all, we have the wisdom and the knowledge and the experience to make these dreams happen. And there will always be enough sufficiency to make that work. So let's not say, oh, I can't make a difference, or that's gonna to take too much money. The sufficiency is there, and we must move now to a sufficient society of abundance in every single aspect of our lives. So thank you very much for listening. You didn't have much choice, you all were muted, but I appreciate you being here. And uh, Miriam, over to you. Wow. Okay. Let me move <laughs> <those fast. laughs> wow. Oh, thank you so much. What a journey. I was actually crying at one point because I just thought, oh, thank goodness, somebody can speak our language. Can you just mute? Um, uh, Miss Mir, second. Are you are muted. I don't know. Uh, Lynn, can you just say something to get the, the screen back? Hello, so, morning, Miss Mir. Yeah. Um, so, um, where do we start? We've got lots of questions in the chat. Can you see them, Lynn? Yes. Yeah, brilliant. Um, so, um, the, f the first one, perhaps, if we just have a couple of those to start with, and then perhaps I'll pick some up. So, um, maybe we'll put a couple of them. Gideon makes an interesting point, picking up on your thing about working together, cooperating. So, this idea that dualism is wrong. Um, men and women, how do we get that balance? And then Catherine says, um, what does she say here? Love to hear about spirituality. Um, how does that fit? Um, use the word spirituality rather than feminine intuition, community, moral, ethic guidance. Love to hear why that word feels right for this. And that's very interesting. Um, and then that's just loads. So yeah, do you want do you want to start with those two? Um, I think also I can't see them, and I'm not sure I got them. I heard something about spirituality. Oh, I see. Sorry. Okay. So there was one about why you use the word spirituality, and there was one about um, your section where you talk about, which I thought was really really good, 
uh, about cooperation, a world, it must be also a world of cooperation between uh, men and women, young and old, blah, blah, blah. And I know that we've always set up in a position, haven't we, you know, that somebody's pinching our pension and somebody, you know, whatever, if, if old people have got a big house and that's going to upset the young and all that, but actually we need to work together. And I thought that point was terribly important that you made. So I wonder if you'd like to pick that up and the idea of spirituality and the idea of how we harness the male and the female in all of us. Um, and I don't, I'm sure you probably know about this, but um, the work of Jared Diamond where he talked about um, chimpanzees and he said there's three chimpanzees and we're one of them. One of them is the common chimpanzees, who's a little bit more violent, perhaps a bit more like us, and the pygmy chimpanzee, the bonobo, that does everything by sex and politics, and us who are stuck in the middle of, and then matrifocal. You know, what elements make a human, and what, how can we harness the human in our body? I think that was really interesting. So if you can pick some of those points up. Yeah, I'm not an expert on chimpanzees, so. No, no, <laughs> no I'm talking about the human, really. <laughs> okay, let me start. <laughs> Spiritually, I also want to come to somebody who think that mask said that really annoyed me. Um, so, um, as far as uh, you've you got me going now, Miriam. Oh, sorry, uh, <laughs> it's been naughty of me to introduce a new idea at this point. But okay, just no, goes to this reality of who we really about, are as an animal. Yes, okay. let me talk about spirituality. So, for me, um, I use that word to cover a whole load of areas because I think uh, everybody is entitled and should be entitled to their own belief system. And for everybody, it's different. So for some, it's more traditional religions and that gives them the support they need and that's their belief. I have a very, I have a son who's taken that path. Um, for me, spirituality, my spiritual beliefs are based on the wisdom that I have come across from actually listening to many teachers and many different followings over the years and coming to my own conclusions. I have a practice that I do every day, morning and night and I chant, uh, and it's, it's based on Buddhism. And it's because it works for me. I've done it on and off for 35 years, and um, the belief system is, it, it's all about really upping our vibration. For me, it's all, that's what works. That I, I can only say that. So I sit in front of my altar twice a day, and I will do my prayers in Sanskrit, and then I will chant for 15 minutes or whatever it is, just to be in balance and to be in myself. And, and I have looked at a certain amount of science on what happens when you chant Nam Myoho Rengikyo, which is my chant. And there is a book out by scientists which so it shows that that, because I've never understood why does that chant work and that one does not as much and what's the difference. For me, it's about balancing out the two sides of my brain and um, the neuro pathways. There actually is neuro pathways that get affected by us making certain um, vibrational chants through music, through voice. And so it's, it's scientifically proved as well. Um, and that then takes me through to the next one, which is about gender and how we can work together and perhaps the chimpanzee in us and about our brains, because it, is, it isn't just men, women, and particularly in this kind of um, group we've got here, you know, we're all conscious, we're all woke in our different ways, and, um, you know, we want to create a better world. But we have the two sides of the brain. It is scientifically proven. And one side of the brain is the reflective, the creative, um, the dreamer, and the other side is the action, the purpose, um, and uh, the producer, and uh, the logic. And, you know, it's very simple to make generalizations and say, well, women are in the right brain and men are in the left brain. But I know a lot of men who are actually more in their dream state. And I know a lot of women who are actually more in their active state. So I think, you know, um, what is said scientifically, and I've done quite a lot of reading about it, and also our hormones affect us as well in different ways, that there is a sort of central place between these two parts of our brain and for women it is physically we are able to go backwards and forwards a lot more but i would suggest you look into it because i'm definitely not an expert on brain on brain <laughs> science but i have read a fair amount about it so it's like it's so is it gender or is it just the type of person we are are we more the dreamer or are we and the reflective or are we more the action logic or are we both and can we bring that together i like to think i've got both and i think for all of us that's what we're working towards and then if we can be working together using those different skill sets um then um that's where we want to be we need the balance we have not had the balance mother earth and 
society has been out of balance. So I don't know about the chimpanzees, but, the, but we as human beings have completely been out of balance between our masculine and our feminine. So what we need to do is not see that we come back as women taking over and then taking over in a very masculine, aggressive way, because a lot of women have had to go that route, whether it's in business or politics, to, to, to um, be successful. Very interesting thing that happened in American politics this week, and I can't remember the name because it's too complicated. A beautiful young um, woman politician in America who stood up for herself after being bullied by that older politician, abused, obviously disgusting language, um, and, and made a wonderful speech, in, and, and it came from a place of absolute wisdom. Um, I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. Somebody else will remember her name, because I know, I, know, it's, I know it's Ortez. I'm sorry, I just can't remember it's one. You know who I mean. But anyway, so we still are living in this world. We're on the steps of the American... Uh, government this week an abusive older man politician was incredibly uh slanderous to this young woman swearing at her in front of journalists and other politicians it was absolutely just alexandra cortez you know you know her name. yeah yeah and she was she just wasn't expecting to make a big even take it further until he made such a disgustingly rude so-called apology that she then stood up and said something so beautiful that it's been repeated all over the world that's what we want to hear and, you know, it has to change. We, we, you know, we haven't moved ahead. There's a program on English television right now, a drama, a drama based on a, uh, English feminism, American feminism from the 70s called Mrs. America, which is just brilliant. Anybody in England hasn't watched it. It's on BBC. It's been on the last two weeks. It's a series. It's fantastic. And it shows how the male politicians in America in the 70s were using their secretaries as sexual toys and how women were treated so appallingly. Even the women politicians were treated so rudely and abusively. And then you see that's from the 70s. And that was on, I watched that on Tuesday, Wednesday. And then Thursday, you read that not only is that happening in the 70s, and there were people like Gloria Stein and Bella Radsey, both of whom I've had the pleasure of meeting, and others, Betty Friedan and others who were standing up and saying, and a, and a, and a large amount of brilliant black women feminists who don't get talked about, but were doing great work there. And um, then you find out it's still going on. And my God, it's going on today. What have we learned 50 years later? What the hell has the word world learned in the last 50, 60 years? Because my God, it hasn't exactly done good for us. And um, I just very briefly going to say something about the masking because somebody put a masking saying it's against everything. I said, it's not against everything. I said, I am vulnerable. I have asthma. I'm 72. I'm one of the first that could get, and I don't believe in the mask. And that's my the priority. So I don't go in supermarkets. I don't go where places I have to wear them. And I make that choice. And everybody should have that personal choice. It's not that I'm going around breathing over everybody. There is no illness in my town. Um, I am just making sure that I don't get into situations where I would need to wear a mask. Thank you. I just wanted to say that. because It doesn't go against me. I believe in freedom of choice and being responsible. I believe in personal responsibility. So I am personally responsible for my health and indeed my and giving that to anybody else. And I care very deeply that people look after themselves. If I was living in central London and going into going on the tube, and, um, you know, going into offices, I would definitely be wearing a mask, but I have made that choice not to be doing that life. So there you go. Sorry, I had to say that. <laughs> can I ask you, can I ask you um, a couple of other questions? Um, I like very much what you said, um, a particular one global nation. I thought that was a really interesting phrase that you've used. And one humanity is the big thing that's come out of this pandemic. We're all in this together and there's no one immune. So I thought that was really interesting. And then I would say that green economics, uh, what I founded, was... Um, Green economics, the economics of caring, sharing, and supporting each other. And the word that's come up a lot this weekend that you've mentioned is the word compassion. And I really wanted to perhaps we can end on you saying something about we're all one humanity and what you just described about bullying, etc. Compassion is something, I don't know if women bring that more, but I do think that people are talking about that in all the talks we've had. They've said, where's the compassion? And if we don't have compassion for ourselves and for other people and, and for the earth and other species, for the ant on the floor, you know, the fly that somebody's about to swat, the animals we're about to eat, without compassion, are we lost? Is that what's gone wrong? And I wondered if you'd like to say a few words about that and the caring, sharing and supporting each other. I think there's a lot of words that we as humanity have lost uh, track of. Compassion is definitely one. Empathy is another. But the biggest word of all is love. And we are being put into a fearful, we are being manipulated. And I speak as someone who was and is in the media. We are being manipulated into a fearful society with silly rules. I'm not going to go back to what I was just talking about before, but silly rules actually don't really even help and can actually make things worse if they're not done properly. And we are 
being turned into a culture where everything is really, decision is based on fear. We have to shift and go back to a culture, a society, a human race that is based on love. And we have to have the intelligence and clarity to be able to make our judgments based on you know, good common sense and love and not allow ourselves to be swept up into this manipulation, which I consider a manipulation of the truth that's going on to create some kind of insane world. Can you mute, David? sense at all. Mm -hmm. So yes, we need compassion. Yes, we need, we need caring. We need to come back to a total place of heart. Heart, that's what it's going to be. We need this, but we need to also make sure it stays here as well. Yes, um, I think that's right. And can you say, because actually I always say, I've said this 10 times in the co conference, um, inspiration and changing the world, 99%, sorry, visionary work is 99% perspiration and 1% inspiration. And I know you've done lots of work in the media and you really are an expert. And for all that you've said, you know how this works. Can you advise us what we can do? And it's homework, we have to work. You know, it's not about training ourselves to the railings, this is really work. What do you think is the single most important thing we can do to make sure that we unmanipulate the media? Work, the homework we can take home to do, all of that. Well, I'm, I'm almost at that point of repeating the Buckminster Fuller because, you know, again, it's not destroying what's there, it's ignoring what's there. And it's correct. You never change things by fighting the existing reality to change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. We have to create local networks. We have to create, we have to be part of, we have to listen, we have to connect. We have to hear the wisdom that we, we are lucky enough to receive from others and share it. Um, doesn't mean that we go and stand on a street corner, but we really do in our own community create something that you have here. You know, it's, it's about sharing information, sharing information and letting people know they're not on their own people feel very isolated and that's why the media are able to manipulate them and the more that they we mask up the more that we that we feel so kind of scared and on our own the more we can be manipulated and so we have to stay strong right yeah, I'm, I, I've just seen something here about a frontline worker seeing your colleagues say, I have total sympathy. Of course you have to wear masks at that, at that point. Of course you do. There's no question about it. It's just depending on the life you're living. I'm not a frontline NHS worker. I'm staying in my little home here. So, um, but anyway, it's about personal trust. So to get, sorry, I lost the plot a bit there. So it really is what I forgot what you're saying. There's so much mask stuff going on here. Yeah, I know. It's funny, isn't it? Good things always have a drama and actually that's a bit of tension over this. We, the policy of the Institute is to wear a mask all the time where there's risk, 100%. And Lynn's the same. She's just saying that sometimes she wants to step out from that society and not have to do that and therefore she won't mix. I am, I am very fortunate. I think we're all agreed on that. Yeah, I we all agree. Thoughts. Yes, I let's not fixate thoughts. on that, everybody else. Yeah, that's completely. No, I, just, I just make my choice at my age, yes. my choice. Yes. I can make a choice. Yeah, first. where to put herself. So so just coming back to that mani manipulation of the media. So yes. you, you, you were saying that we need to have local, and that's really part of it, isn't it? That we can act in our local communities and be strong there. And this globalization of everything, which is manipulated by large scale economies of scale, actually skews us into attention isn't actually naturally there is that kind of thing you're saying that, really that's beautifully as a said, humanity we together. are having come from a pr background having come from an understanding on how the media works and an understanding on how people can be influenced into thinking a certain way i can see it on a daily basis like we had in the uk those daily um uh press conferences at five o'clock which people ended up people i know they ended up stopped watching at the beginning we were all just fixated yeah. listening to all this yeah. and then on a daily basis, it would contradict each other. We'd hear one thing one day and another thing the next. I'm not saying they were set up for manipulation. I'm just saying that from all sides, we are being sent a lot of information, which puts us into a state of fear. And we have to stay in a state of calm, compassion, and love. We have to go from fear to love. And that is not closing my eyes or any of our eyes to the reality of what's going on, where people are dying and where people need support clearly i mean domestic violence alone in this country has risen like 40 percent or more um over this pandemic period because people are stuck at home they would have been able to stay with an abusive partner um and they can't escape there are things happening which are not directly to do that are not directly covid uh, situations but they are because of 
mental health that's being affected by so many people, mental health of children who have been taken away from their peers. I mean, the, the, actually the economy itself and what's gonna happen. And let's not forget that the economy, we, where we, if we come back here next year, let's look at where the economy is then, because we're not gonna be having the same situation. The countries are bankrupt. Money has been printed like it's just paper. Mm. And um, they're trying to turn us into a paperless society. I haven't even gone in that route. So I don't wanna go in the fear route, but we can see what's happening. I mean, not, I'm, I can see what's happening. I'm not living in a, in a dream world. So it's like can you mute, now, okay. now it's a time. We've got a few months where we can really make the preparations to work together, come together, and create this new future by looking locally, growing our own, speaking, being together, being there for others, mentoring, being with the children, and being aware of what can come and making sure that we've got the new in place.